Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Back and Forth uh, podcast about logistics. Today we have a very special guest again. His name is Chris Greentree. He is the industry innovation specialist for TAFE New South Wales. We're going to be talking a lot about the TAFE New South Wales syllabus that is for logistics. And um, I'll be asking quite a few questions that um, that's always been curious for me in terms of what TAFE New South Wales does for the industry. Um, so stay tuned. I hope you'll find this episode informative and entertaining. Thank you. Chris, welcome and thank you. Um, I will try to make this as painless as possible, um, but this is only my first few times in a rodeo, so I'm not a professional by any measure. Uh, I'm driven by the quality of the content more so than how we present it. So, um, so feel free to be you. Yeah. Um, because I'm here just to dig at your brain and uh, and to really get a better understanding what you know what what TAFE New South Wales means for logistics and vice versa. Yeah. Um, maybe just for the privilege of our audience, would you like to give us a quick background and some some of your highlights of your career thus far? Yeah, sure, sure, and uh, great to be with everyone. Um, I actually started in logistics, believe it or not, okay. and I'm back in logistics. So my first job was actually working in a warehouse, um, hauling alcohol around on a uh, on a pallet jack, wrapping it all up and, and getting on a truck so people could enjoy their Christmas. Right. And I did that after my HSC yeah. uh, before becoming a mechanic. Okay. And um, I was in the army. Yeah. Uh, I was in a transport squadron. Logistics uh, again. Logistics <laughs> again. Yeah, yeah. we're frontline transport, so yeah. we're taking um, food, ammunition and people to yeah. frontline. Yeah. Uh, it was a peaceful army back then, so uh, no overseas service or anything like that. Right. And then um, I ended up in this place called TAFE New South Wales yeah. as a teacher. Right. And I was teaching automotive trades. Okay. And it was fantastic. It was the best thing out. Right. And one thing leads to another. You uh, you do different parts in the organisation. You end up as an innovation specialist. Yes. So here I am. So, you know, f- funny you said about the military background uh, in the, the famous saying is, you're right, logistics wings walls, right? Yeah. You know, which, you know, if you can't get products or you, you can't get supplies to the front line efficiently, you know, you're going to lose the war. And from history, you've told us many, you know, many great wars. and the supply chain. Yeah, have been lost due to logistics, you know. Yeah. I mean, World War II, essentially, if you look at it, right? Yeah. Um, so very interesting background. So how long have you been at TAFE New South Wales? Well, I started... It's been an on and off relationship. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I started off back in the 90s as right. a part-time teacher. Right. And then went away for a little bit to run my own business. Yeah. And um, funny enough, that was all to do with logistics as well now that I think about it. Okay. I had a Snap-on Tools franchise. No way. And so, um, you know, you think about that where the tools that I was selling to the uh, mechanics, the direct users. Yes. Um, that all came from our DC, our distribution centre out at uh, Western Sydney. Right. And then, you know, we had to program in advance what we wanted so we could get that manufactured from overseas, shipped from the States over. So, yeah. I remember um, when I first joined the industry, Snap-on Tools was a client for the company I was with back then. And they were massive, you know, because all the tools, toolboxes, you know, that iconic red colour with the Snap-on Tools. Love it, You know, massive trays and all the trays of tools, you know. I think those things cost a fortune, right? And uh, all from the US because a US company. Um, and, uh, and I remember one of the, well, back in those days when I was young and I was into cars, one of the coolest things to have was the snap-on tools car seats. You know, those cloth. The seat yeah, the, you know, the seat you, covers. I used to get pulled out by the cops. <laughs> and I'd pull up and it's like everything okay. And he goes, mate, you got any of those snap-on seat covers? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, 55 bucks coming back. <laughs> Well, those were innocent days of the world back then, right? <laughs> the, I, I, so I think these days, yeah, yeah, we don't get too many people get very high about sea covers. <laughs> no, no, it was one of those fads, but it must have gone for about ten years. Yeah, the snap-on yeah, sea covers, yeah, yeah. they were everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, head of innovation um, in TAFE New South Wales for logistics. So, can you tell us what your normal day or average day looks like? I've got one of the best jobs in the world, okay, uh, yeah. like you, actually. <laughs> I get to talk to really interesting people, right? industry, right? and the conversations are around the lines of, okay, so what do you do? Yeah. Tell me about your business. Right. And then after they tell me about their business, tell me about your staff. Yeah. Tell me about the gaps. What do you need? Yeah. What, what do we do? Yeah. What are we doing? Are we training well enough? 
what can we do better? Is there something we're not doing that we need to do? Yes. So yes. that's the kind of conversations. And um, I look after logistics and a lot of industries associated with that, transport, trucking, Busing, yeah. shipping, yeah. aviation. Yes. But it's all linked together, you know. Yes. And so yes. my job's about in order for, for TAFE to be innovative, we actually have to understand where the friction is, what, what's the problems. Yes. You've got to speak to industry. Yeah. Right. I mean. We can't yeah. just sit in our little no. house over there at Ultimo head office no. and say, okay, let, let's design some new training products and everyone's going to roll in because we think it's good for them. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, you know, I think when you – have engagement with the people on the front lines. That's how you maintain the relevance of your education yeah. to, who, to whoever wants to partake, TAFE, New South Wales. And, you know, one thing that I think always have separated TAFE greatly to universities has been that accessibility by people at all ages, uh, all age groups, all, you know, all backgrounds, any type of socioeconomic um, type of circumstances, right? It's not like we spoke earlier, a set commitment, but more so, okay, well, I want to come and learn this, just have a bit of a top up in this skill and that skill, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, and that's the fundamental difference between, I think, university and TAFE New South Wales. It's a, it's a really good point you make because, you know, we've got this open door policy. Yeah. It's, it's there for everyone. It's a fantastic concept, you know. Yeah. We have people from overseas, from Asia, from North America, and they say, tell us how this, this vet thing works, vocational yeah. education training. Yes. And I think because it's open door and there's not a lot of restrictions to enrolling and to getting in, mm -hmm. there's that uh, illusion then that the quality of education and learning in TAFE yes. isn't at the same level as it is in a university. Now, I'm not saying that uh, a, a degree or a master's is – uh, just as easy as a certificate three. I'm yes. not saying that. Yes. Totally different kind yes. of, of learnings, kind of totally different kind of learners. Yes. Totally different outcomes. Yes. But because it's open and because you don't you, know, you don't have to get a certain ATAR in order to enrol into a TAFE course. Yes. There's that illusion back in the homes that, you know, maybe a, a TAFE qualification isn't going to be as prestigious, isn't going to make you as successful yes. as if you went into a uh, a university degree. Yes. Well, you know, then I have a very um, – well, it's, it, it's an interesting question for me because I would love to know the answer is that putting the university syllabus just um, on, on one hand and put the TAFE syllabus on another hand, um, you know, when you study, say, for example, a degree or a master's for logistics or what have you, it's, it's a set number of years, right? Mm. A set number of courses, units you've got to do and what have you. And I can't imagine that syllabus change too often within the course of those years. How often does TAFE New South Wales syllabus change during yeah. its educational yep. process or what you want to call that? So what, what a lot of people don't understand is the, the framework for vocational training. Yeah. Right? It, it is a nationally recognised system. Yes. And I think it's one of the best in the world. Right. Um, and so industry come together and they – decide on what makes up a qualification and a skill. Right. And then based upon that intel from industry, qualification is born. Right. Now in the transport and logistics sector, yes. we're actually in the middle of going through a transition right. into a new qualification. Right. And the last qualification was around about four years. Right. So after four years, we had a little bit of an adjustment. Right. Now for in TAFE, that's a bit of a headache because that means <laughs> new assessments. That means, you know, yeah, making yeah. sure that your teachers can demonstrate their currency and they have the right units of competency to deliver. And there's lots of head headaches and yes. paperwork. Yes. But at the end of the day, what it means is the qualification that you walk away with yes. is going to be current. Yes. It's going to be relevant to what industry requirements are. Right. And uh, you haven't wasted your time. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I think that's where I think TAFE, becomes a lot more accessible in that regard, right? Because it's easier. The, the barriers for entry is a little bit easier, like you said earlier, mm. right? But I'm not going to, you know, use that as a measure of quality, right? Quality is a quality. It's, it's based on the content that you're yeah. delivering to the students, right? And and I don't care if it's at Oxford University or TAFE New South Wales. Um, you've got to look at the actual product, yeah, right? Well, what's the and, outcome? Yeah, what's the outcome? And, uh, and, and I know that... Um, 
I've been wanting to push forward my agenda as well with educational bodies such as yourself is to open up um, our platform here, which is a real life um, freight forwarding slash logistics business where we invite students to come actually get um, 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 a first taste into the industry and see what you know what we do as a smaller part of the greater picture that is logistics, what that entails and what have you. And I think you and I will have a few more conversations on how we can make that happen. And the real purpose for why I'm interested in doing that, it's really just about keeping the syllabus or keeping the education relevant to that. When someone comes to TAFE and they graduate, they on day one of graduation, they're going to have a real set of um, skill sets that's going to be applicable the very next day. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, and that's why like really interesting in, in understanding more about how syllabuses um, or the logistics syllabus in the TAFE New South Wales, actually, you know, that structure, how it um, evolves and how often it gets revamped or refreshed or whatever you want to call it. Um, so given that front, you know, over the years um, of you being at the helm of innovation and talking to industry and then also maybe looking inward at the students or the people that's coming through, well, both in and out, the industry and the students, what has been the biggest change that you've noticed? What's been the biggest change? I guess um, first thing is the use of digital tools. Okay. All right. Um, when I talk to our head teacher, Dennis, you know, he, yeah, he used Dennis. To talk, you know, he's a customs broker. Yes. And he's talking about all the time how many times you have to sign a document, you yes. know, the piece of paper that goes through and all the rest of it. Yes. And how that's starting to change now where we, you know, we send an email or we have an automatic uh, uh, blockchain system where, you know, you sign a, a PDF that, that starts to transit around the place, you know, as we... Uh, uh, have the goods go from one country. So to your own life. miniature blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny you stitched that word in there. Well, <laughs> I like it. Well, it is. <laughs> I like it. It is true. It's true. But you know, <laughs> there's so much special specialization in this industry yeah. that it's not just one qualification that says, "Okay, here you go. We're going to give you this one qualification. Out you go. You're going to know everything there is about supply chain yeah. uh, operations." Yes. Because it's not like that. Yes. You know, there's the procurement side, there's the customs broken side. Yes. There's the physical stuff, you know, yes. the warehouse operations, yes. truck operations. Then you've got to, you know, you think about the planning exercises, you know, if you've got all these trucks whizzing around delivering containers and dropping stuff off. Yes. You've got the scheduling. Yes. Then there's the maintenance to keep the trucks going. Yes. So I think I think the big problem here is um, because we've got such now a very complex industry, if you were to, you know, go into a school and say, hey, is anyone interested in, you know, joining the supply chain industry, mm. join the logistics mm. industry, they'd mm. look at you with a blank face. They That's wouldn't right. know what it was. That's right. That's right. In yeah. fact, I don't even know sometimes, you know, I start <laughs> thinking about it all and it's like, yeah, that's, yeah, we can call that supply chain as well, yeah. you know. Well, that's the thing is, is there a push? And I know it's going to be very, very challenging. Is there any type of motivation through your networks or through the people you uh, socialise or you know network with, talking about this subject matter, even at the regulatory side of things, in terms of standardising? Let's not talk about standardising policies or process. Let's just talk about standardising language, because you know it's unregulated, right? For example, like you know, and if you look at other industries, um, you're either a lawyer or you're not. Right, okay, you're a lawyer and you're focusing on this sector or you're a doctor, you're focusing on this type of anatomy and what have you, right? But with logistics, there's none, no regulations whatsoever, right? And, and it doesn't matter if you've got a diploma from TAFE New South Wales or if you've got a master's from University of Sydney or wherever, right? There is no set, well, there is no standard regulated or re, I mean, type of terms we call ourselves and what yeah. the work we do. Um, you know, for example, like, you know, a lot of the trucking companies in Australia, they call themselves logistics companies. But in fact, they're not logistics companies. They are just literally a transport company. That's it. Right? But then you've got, you know, like, um, 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 you know, there's so many people sort of cross-utilise these words and jargons 
that, like you said, sometimes I get confused. What is actually this company? You're an analyst. <laughs> yeah. Or you're a project <laughs> officer or a project manager. Yeah. Now they could all be fitting right inside this business even, you know? So do you think it's feasible then that we actually arrive at a set of standardised language for the industry? I don't think so. I why is that? Why, why not? I, I, I mean, if we can do it for the lawyers and the doctors, why can't we do it for the logistics people? Like we, we can call a truck driver truck driver. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we can call, you know, someone that plans uh, routes a route planner. Yeah. We can call someone that um, uh, looks at the data and analyses how a systems work so that they can actually create some sort of uh, automate, auto, automatic software to, to track things, you know. And we could call them an analyst or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, uh, uh, there's just so many different occupations in the supply chain industry. Yes. You know, I, I'm, I just don't think, um, I don't think we can have just a term for a couple of different workers in this industry. Yes. I think it's so complex, which it is, yes. and it's so big. Yes. Um, we're just going to have multiple employees with different job titles because there's so much specialisation. I don't think, I guess that, that, that probably comes around to our answer here. Mm. I don't think one person can do everything there is involved in supply chain and, and have their head around it. Mm. It's mm. teamwork. Mm. Mm. You know, it's it's relying on the software guys and, and those guys that write all the AI. It's relying on a company that, that transports Bought stuff on the back of a truck. It's relying on another company that operates a shipping line, you know. Yes, yes. And so all those interrelationships that are going on with multiple industries that are all linked together. Well, then, and, and I totally get you what you're trying to say. You are right. Like, for example, you know, just even in um, even in freight forwarding world, which what we do, transacting an international shipment from from one point to another, right? We, you know, and I've touched on this in the past, there's more than 20 sets of hands, yeah. both physically and administratively. So in that 20 sets of hands, there's 20 sets of titles, right? And that's just within the freight forwarding world. And then you're talking about the maintenance of logistics, all that. So that just grows exponentially, right? Yeah. Um, so can we pale, uh, peel back or pull back from the that type of granular type of scenario and more into a more macro, if we can call it that, a scenario where we just by saying, okay, say, for example, I'm a freight forwarder, right? <clears throat> I should only be known as a freight forwarder. Mm. You know what I mean? Say you're a trucking company. You should be ever only be called a transport company. You're not allowed to use any other name. Will that get through the mark? Oh, my God. <laughs> what would that, what, you know, but the thing is, but if you think again, if like I I know this might sound you know a bit silly to some people, but the thing is thing is if you look at all of the other industries, it's it's it doesn't need to be you know translated or explained. It's just what it is. And yet when it comes to logistics, you know exactly you're like, oh no, geez, how you know like how do we get past that? So what about toll? Would you call them logistics? Well, they've got many divisions. Yeah, you've right. Got your ships. You got your, your, they've got so your many planes, divisions. Yes. Trucks. So, again, that's fine. Once you sort of, I guess you, I guess you go through like a checkbox type of thing, right? You tick, 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 and your business application, what have you, or through an industry body, or what have you. Once you tick through that, you get, you, you can call yourself that. Once you tick this minute, but you call yourself that. And look, I'm not here for segregation, right? I love anybody who loves logistics because it's important. I, I want more to people to join it. But the thing is, we can't encourage people to join it, like you said, and we agree on this, when as soon as we say the word, nobody actually knows what the hell is going on. Well, they, they can't really explain for themselves what it is. Yeah. So if I can't explain something what it is, there's no chance I'm going to be wanting to join it because I don't understand it. So, yes, what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to get to is can we create some clarity? Can we create some silos within this industry so that people at least have a general idea as opposed to, well, you know, like I always use the word logistic. And sometimes I know what we do here isn't full flog logistics. Mm. It's mostly freight forwarding with a bit of local transport, mm. right? Where we've customs broken, thrown in, all that sort of stuff. And there's some 3PL. But logistics is so much more, yeah, right? It's like uh, supply chain coordination. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. You know, exactly right. One of the things we did, um, COVID brought out a lot of innovation over the last couple of years. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, who would have thought we'd be meeting on online as much as we do or delivering classes online 
as much as we do. Yeah. But there's been some good advantage there. And one of those advantages was um, we used to have this event called Green Light Day. Okay. Right? And it was a collaboration between Education Department, TAFE New South Wales yes. and Transport. Right. And what we would do is we'd coordinate excursions for school kids to go to different transport companies uh, to get a bit of a taste of see what it was like in this industry. It nice. might be a, uh, a local transport company. It might be a large container terminal. Yes. And it was about raising the awareness of yes. that. Yes, yes. And when COVID happened, um, TAFE was contracted to deliver this. You know, we were paid to do it, <laughs> but we couldn't because everyone was in lockdown. Yes. And so we said, oh, why don't we, why don't we do an excursion online? Right. So we did that and we went out to um, Cube Logistics yes. out at the Moorbank Logistics Park. Yep, yep, massive. Yep. And we invited a couple of representatives from different parts of the supply chain industries to talk about their job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we had a young woman from Coca-Cola Amatel yep. and she was a logistics manager there. We had a, a fellow in charge of all the trucks right. and a fellow in charge of all the trains for Cube and a couple of other different uh, young people who were doing different jobs. And what was the uptake rate, like, in terms of, like... Uh, we had 600 the people online. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> try try organising an excursion for 600. Yeah, you're not going to get that. You don't get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're going to go back to doing the, um, doing the live events, yeah. but it's going to be a hybrid now because everyone says no one wants to sit in front of a computer anymore, right? Yeah. We've, we've, we've done our dash yeah. with... Uh, online meetings, even though this YouTube video is going online. But um, yeah, what, what we're going to do now is we're going to do the same thing to try and get that education out there about all the different careers yeah. that young people can do. Yes. That's exciting. Yes. How the technology is changing. Right, right. And then seeing some of this firsthand, you know. Right, right. Like imagine taking a bunch of kids into, say, Amazon into their warehouse. The you know, and th they won't be meeting any humans. They saw robots. No, that's it. <laughs> and, and, and all the smarts that went on to try and, you know, predict, you know, uh, which, which goods are going to be sold the most, yeah. where they have to sit in the warehouse so there's less travel time for the, for the little robot to get to the, the box, you know, where it's getting packed. Um, it just blows your mind and it blows yeah. young people's minds when they think about all the opportunities there are. Yeah. What does it look like for someone who's potentially wanting to come to TAFE New South Wales and study logistics and supply chain in TAFE? How much it costs for 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 potential students and uh, and the different options that's available? Well, I'm going to use your word now. Okay. Right? It's accessible. <laughs> okay. I love that word. So, so what does that mean to our viewers? Yes. Um, traineeships, apprenticeships. Yeah. For a couple of years now, yeah. our state government has said fee free. Oh, wow, wow, okay. It's pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, that it used to be $2,000 was a, a qualification uh, student contribution. Right, right, right. So if you were an apprentice, you'd have about a $2,000 enrolment fee. Right. And a couple of years ago the government says, no, nope, we're going to make it more accessible, we're going to make it easier to enrol. Right. And we're going to cut the fee. We'll pay for wow, it. Wow, wow. And then for, for those courses that um, aren't on the fee-free list, they're still pretty you know, accessible. Yeah. Um, oh, it's great. <laughs> you, you know, we were two, four thousand dollars somewhere around there for yes. for some of the qualifications yes. we offer. You know, in in the logistics training package, yeah. which is perfectly accessible for uh, uh, perfectly accessible for someone who who just wants to do something new, change something. You know, pick up a new hobby. You know, let, I mean, let's call it a change of career as a new hobby. Yeah. Um, someone who is you know being doing what they've done previously maybe for 10, 20 years and all of a sudden they're going through um, a shift in their mentality they're through the mid-years of their lives and they want to join a new industry and they're paying two to $4,000 to have that real bolt-on accessible mm. education. It's not a lot because, you know, these days you can pay a lot more than that for a lot less. Well, we were talking about a guy wanting to work, do an internship with you for six months. Now, six months with no income... Yes, yes. That's a lot of money, you know. Yes, yes. And the other thing we bought out was um, these new training products called TAFE Micro Skills. Right. And these are industry-driven, industry-dictated skills, really short, sharp, to-the-point skills. Right. Okay? So we, we just bought out some uh, only early this year for, say, electric buses. Right. All right. So background story, government says 
we need to do more about reducing emissions. Yeah. Transport's a big emitter. Yep. We have control over our government bus fleet. Yep. Let's make zero emission buses a right. policy and replace all our buses in New South Wales with zero emission buses. Great idea. Well, we've got to think about our workers now, you know, the people servicing the buses, the people driving the buses, the people moving the buses around the bus yards, the people who pick them up when they're broken down the Harbour Bridge. You know, all these workers need a bit of training. And so we brought out a set of baseline training skills, familiarisation courses for working safely around electric buses. And those courses cost between $100 and $200 to enrol in. Wow. You know? Oh, again, And like, so that's, yeah. that little example there is about listening to what the industry gap was, what the training requirement was, what do we need to do so that industry can move forward in this really great strategic project, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then developing a training product and putting it in the marketplace so people yeah. can upskill. Yeah, well, one to two hundred dollars it's really no money at all these days. Right? Yeah. You know, so to 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 be able to newly skill yourself up towards a new technology and remain relevant for one or two hundred dollars. That's yeah. uh, I mean, really, that's no money at all. Like, really, like you, know, you're, you're, you guys are really giving it away. <laughs> the, like the, bu- the buzzword is, you know, you've got to be able to pivot. Yeah. Everyone uses that these yeah. days, you know. Well, it's but, a good analogy. I remember, you know, it's, it's a great, great skill set, especially in basketball when I used to play basketball. <laughs> you got to pivot. Yeah, that's it. Well, you know, like we're a pretty big organisation and yeah. for us to pivot, pivot yeah. nice and quickly, yeah. you know, that's, um, that's been a bit of a feat for us because... But, uh, yeah, sorry, but... But, but again, I, I've always thought that TAFE New South Wales had better pivoting than universities. Is that true to say? I think it comes back to, and I don't know if we talked about it before, but, the tra- you know, the way training packages work. Yeah. You know, and training packages are dictated by industry. Yes. You know, I, I had a, um, an employer come up to me at a trade show a couple of weeks back and he says, oh, this qualification you're delivering in this area, it's no good. I said, all right, well, thanks for telling us. Um, you know, what, what, what can we fix up? Where is it no good? And what it came down to actually was that the training package, yes. which we deliver to, needs to be updated. Right. And so industry has a really big role here in helping ensure that training that TAFE delivers yes. is relevant to its needs. Because if industry doesn't input, the training package doesn't change. And if the training package doesn't change, you know, uh, the only way that TAFE can then stay innovative and, you know, deliver stuff that's relevant for the day is to go outside of qualifications and deliver non-nationally recognised training. So industry's got a bit of a responsibility here. Yeah. Well, it's great to see that, you you know, TAFE New South Wales actually has <clears throat> a keen understanding and focus on industry engagement. Mm. With, without that, you know, I mean, what are we teaching here? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it's really good to hear. And I think for anyone who is... <clears throat> looking to really pick up a new skill set. And, and I'm sure this industry engagement isn't just with supply chain logi- uh, and logistics. It's, it's, it's across the board with yeah. all your courses. So anyone who's thinking about doing TAFE New South Wales courses, for them to actually understand that, okay, we're learning something, but there's a good bunch of folks such as Chris here who's constantly engaging with industry to get their feedback and then bring that relevance back into the teachings and the be- uh, or back into the education. Yeah. Um, so that's very wonderful to hear. Yeah. Um, awesome. Now... The second uh, a conversation, oh. which I'm going to hit you because you already told me this is going to be a hard question, um, and that is in the face – well, you, you are probably the perfect person to really answer this question because oh, you, are the, you are the innovation specialist for industry. It's the title. <laughs> <laughs> There's no back door here, mate. <laughs> um, the, um, you and I, I think we've already touched on in the past a few times on this already, and we're both in agreement, and that is um, we know that uh, for us the automation technology is coming, right? There is no way around it. It's coming. How quickly it will come um, 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 uh, will really depending a lot on, I guess, adoption and also regulation or with all of that. In the face of that, I, for one, know that a lot of my good people at TGL will not, their roles will not look like what they are doing today within, I say, maybe five years. In fact, I'll probably that wouldn't. Far. Yeah. Well, I would have said shorter. Well, you see, and there's a reason why I say that because, and, and, and I'll give you a hint, 
um, it's called status quo. Mm. Never underestimate the power of status quo. Yeah, that's true. Okay, never underestimate the power of status quo. Um, but the reality is in five years, I don't feel that I will have the roles available for that I have today in mm. five years. So I won't be recruiting, I mean, recruiting the same people that I was recruiting, that, that I'm recording today. Mm. Um, so that's going to be a challenge for industry. That's going to be a challenge for me. So where do I, you know, how, what does my company look like in five years? You know, this is a constant thought in my mind on, on a daily basis. So how does that apply to education um, um, platforms? You know, you know how, so, so how does that apply in your world to understand that this technology tsunami is coming in? Then, and we're still teaching people these skill sets who potentially is, is no longer exist. How do you guys balance that? And how do you guys, you know... So I was thinking yeah. about the answer there yeah. when you're saying, yeah. because yeah. Um, when you first asked me, well, the camera's offline, I thought, <laughs> shivers, I don't even know that answer. But I guess it comes down to, comes back to my job, I think, in a way, of having that clear understanding, those good conversations of like we're having now, to understand what are the, the needs and the requirements and the answer might be in, in, you know, more short courses, more little skill sets, yeah. you know, that, that target a key bit of information like, you know, operating some sort of AI or, or smart technology that can track something as, as it leaves, you know, the factory goes on a truck, gets transported to a, a container, yeah. maybe in on a ship, goes off at a port onto another ship, onto yeah. another ship. Like there's a lot of software going on. Now, that's not the scary part. There's some smart guy behind the scenes that's going to write that AI that's going to help all of us yeah. work out when exactly, you know, that thing that I just bought on eBay is going to get to my consumer. Yeah. But then it's the skill required is how to navigate and interact with that software, you know. And I don't think that's a really big hard thing for us in the future, you know. I think about covid Thing buzzing around me there. <laughs> um, I think about COVID, and as an organisation, we had to th- pause our delivery. Right, so most of our delivery was face to face, and then in the space of four weeks, yes, we were forced to transform our delivery mode mm-hmm. from face to face learning to connected delivery, where we had a class of twenty five people, and they all showed up on our little laptop, and we're sharing knowledge and skills. Yeah. Now, that was a very fast learning journey for our staff. And, you know, we got staff that, you know, might be in their 50s and 60s and they've had to turn around and work out how to engage with that technology. Yeah. Now, the fact that we're able to do it means that, you know, as we have technology changes in AI and those, you know, we've got to start to increase the digital plasticity of, of our workers. Yes, yes. I think I think it's a doable thing, you know. Yeah. And and it's through short courses, right. you know. Right. Um, and the manufacturers of tech are going to play a bigger role, you know. I think about that that bus analogy I was talking about before, you know, with what we're doing there. And the only reason why we wrote we're able to write those micro skills in such a short time frame yes. is because we had the bus manufacturers coming to us saying, "Hey." We can see a problem here. If we don't have a suitable training system out there, we could have safety compromised yeah. and we can't afford that because that will derail our whole project of transitioning our buses. Yes. So because of that, because of the risks associated, yes. we really want to work with TAFE yes. to design the courses. Yes. And I think that will happen as well. As as new tech emerges in the future, um, innovation specialists like myself yes. should be in touch with, you know, who's making the tech who's the big players, talking to those big players, yes. getting them to come to TAFE so that we can um, co-design training yes. that's relevant yes. and allows that next leap in technology. Yes. And I think, you know, well, very well answered and I and I completely agree with you in terms, you know, especially when the future isn't clear. I mean, let's face it, the future isn't clear for anyone in Some any written. industry, right? Yeah. Um, micro courses, as you will say, the micro-knowledge, bolt-on, bolt-on, bolt-on. It's, yep. it's really the pragmatic way of handling an uncertain future, yeah. right? You nudge, you nudge, you nudge, you nudge. As new tech build, you, you, and you keep on bolting yourself on so you can, I guess, remain relevant as much as you can. 
Can, can I just say though, yeah. while that's happening, right? Yeah. You've then got those other conversations going on where industry is collaborating together, yeah. and they're updating training packages. Yes. Now, that those training packages are always just a little bit behind yeah. the little bolt-on spoke training that we spoke about. Yeah. All right. And at a federal level, you know, the government's looking at the way training packages are designed and the processes there yeah. to try and make that a little bit quicker right. so that the qualifications right. are right behind today. Not too not, far. Not a couple of years yeah, behind Not a couple of years, but, you know, just, just yeah. slightly Cause behind. Because we'll, yeah. we'll never be able to achieve that, you know. Well, it's chicken and the egg, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 We're always chasing. Yeah, yeah. Well, the fact that we are chasing re- keeps us in the race. <laughs> <laughs> you can come out with some beauties today. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, this tsunami of tech has been one of the probably the most um, um, complex thoughts that I have recurring in my mind. <laughs> Purely, again, I guess it's one of those things is how do I remain relevant or how does my business remain relevant and how does my industry remain relevant? Um, you know, with automation, robotics, blockchain, all that sort of, sort of stuff, um, you know, they are talking essentially doctors are replaceable, lawyers are, are replaceable. We, I actually saw a, um, a, a mini documentary on YouTube um, whereby, you know, they were pitch, uh, pitching this AI module against um, one of the top law firms and deciphering contracts. I think it's something like that. You know? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've read about this. Yeah, and uh, AI was, you know, absolutely destroyed the human lawyers, destroyed them, right? So in view of that, right, I mean, let's face it, lawyering, doctoring um, um, has been two of the most prestigious industries known to men, okay? Um, and if those industries cannot remain relevant, you know, I always challenge them all then, God, I mean, what kind of future does that entail for logistics and supply chain people? And even more so, I think, you know, we touched on this earlier in the podcast is that because logistics uh, um, or to manage supply chain logistics successfully, it requires a lot of relationships, coordination, and to make, you know, because those are usually where the mistakes or things go wrong. You know, it's, it's, it's during the the relationships and the coordination. But once robotics and automation takes over, all of that will be gone instantly. So the attractiveness for larger companies in my industry will be to say, well, if that is efficiency, then my tech that I will be designing will be to replace my human element. And that will be a logical thought process because that's efficiency and I'm very confident all of them are doing that as we speak and they're already doing that with, you know, robotics in warehouses and it's completely replaced the human yep. um, involvement. So then you look at a smaller company such as myself and go, God, if, if that's my competitor, they're going for full-fledged efficiency, right? I can't compete with that because I don't have the resources or the means to design full automation with robots and all of that mm. sort of stuff. So the only way I have or I can try to, again, be pragmatic about it, is to create tech that doesn't replace my people, but again, retool and re-kit them with a new set of knowledge, similar to what Tave New South Wales is doing. Yeah. So bolting those micro um, 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 skill sets onto them in understanding what this tech will do for their customers. So they, they can be the translator of this tech to our customers and then be the implementer and then ultimately become a consultant to our customers where my people are no longer worrying about transacting a shipment because that's already done at the back end. Mm. My folk, my people will be just making sure that the back end is done correctly from an overwatch type of scenario. But more importantly, once they have these key data sets, then they can go back and communicate those data sets, human to human interaction with our customers to allow them to understand what does this data mean for you? How is your business doing with the data we have been working to nurture from you so that you can run a better successful business? And I think that is my current pathway in where I'm building my tech towards and where I feel that if 
us humans, and I, and I use this word like I'm some sort of alien overlord, <laughs> if us humans want to stop this existential crisis we're having, that we can see automation and the robots coming and take over, because if we just allow things to replace us, what the hell are we all going to be doing? Going to the beach. <laughs> but there's only so long you can go to the beach. But, you know, I think we're some way off before the whole world becomes a vending machine, right? Yes. Um, because in order for us to be a vending machine where you press a button and automatically something just puts itself automatically on a truck and makes its way across the other side of the world and dodges the Panama Canal yes. and dodges all the weather. Yes. You know, we're, we're, we're light years away because everyone has to be connected, Yes. you know, yes. to the machine. Yes. And, you know, where we're getting some of our supplies from, we're, we're doing trade with developing countries, you know, which... You know, they don't even have broadband, you know. Yeah. This will be an industry of trust and relationships yeah. and checking those relationships yeah. and checking those trusts yeah. in order to provide service that's going to be above your competitor's yeah. service because yeah. that's what it's about, you know. I was telling you before about how, you know, I've got this home project going on and uh, and the... <laughs> With the a salami critical, machine. <laughs> that's it. The critical piece of equipment for making salamis yeah. is the press yeah. Yeah. and the switch yeah. Yeah. is busted. Yeah. And now I've got to get that switch yeah. and I've got a time factor going because the salami day is on the 10th of July. Yes. And that gives me just on a month. Yes. And the only place where is supplying these switches are all out of China. So I've got to try and get something out of China. Surprise, surprise. Across <laughs> over here yeah, yeah, yeah. in less than 30 days, which is going to be a challenge. Well, you can. Is the product ready? Is the, the part already made? It's, it's already made. It's ready to be sent, correct? What are you, are you going to put your freight forwarding cap on? Well, yeah, absolutely. We can, <laughs> we can bring it in with air freight for you. There's no issue. You can get it yeah. here. As long as the product is ready. Now, if the product isn't ready, then that's beyond the reach of our we'll <laughs> the supply chain we'll, management. <laughs> we'll talk offline. But the thing is, it's about, you know, it, I was looking on the websites of all these different suppliers and it's like, yeah, yeah. we've got it in stock, we can ship it. And then I do the little Google thing, you know, in the background, say, hang on a minute, these guys are legit. Uh, yeah. And it's like 1.4 out of 10 star ratings. And so that's, I think that's the key there, is working out those relationships and, and getting a system that's reliable because well, that's what yeah. the consumers want. Perfect example. Well, it's all about relationships, right? Like, for example, this is probably a little bit of a sidetrack to the relationship we're talking about because of our relationship, because I've heard your conundrum. And I'm saying this on a camera, so I'm not going to be um, 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 I'm going back on my word and commitment here. My because of the relationship here, as long as your product is ready, TGL will bring your switch for the sausage press before 10th of July. Oh. Because happy wife, happy life, they say. That's exactly um, right. But again, but, you know, we can laugh about this, but that's the truth, isn't it? And that's the beauty in why, you know, why we get on with all of our customers. It is not because we book a shipment and gets here. It's because of that relationship. It's because they know that if they pick up the phone, they've got someone to talk to and they actually, you know, be empathetic to their needs. And then, you know, and if you create good relationships with the people who you work with, magic happens. You can't do that with tech yet That's because exactly. tech is black and white, right? I know sometimes, for example, we use platforms online where we book certain couriers and what have you. And they've got cutoffs in terms of certain time and what have you. And if you fall out by a second, you cannot. Gone. Gone. But if I got the phone of the operator at the back and go, listen, you know, we're, we're, we're five minutes late. We're doing, oh, yeah, no worries. We'll chuck it on for you. The last I checked, no AI technology is able to replicate that. What's the term? Computer says no. Yes. <laughs> there we have it. Computer it. says no. So, again, I think, really, I think we've arrived at the word for this podcast, and that is to remain relevant and not have an existential crisis. Rely on the human nature of needing to have relationships hmm. and good ones at that because when you have a good relationship, doesn't matter what it is we do in life, things just happen. Yeah. You know? and, um, and we will get the switch for the salami press. So make sure that your relationship with your wife remains solid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, that's, that's this one little thing. And then last week I was sitting with the, uh, the truck manufacturing industry and it was the state committee meeting. Yeah. 
and it went for three hours and we spent about an hour yeah. on, guess what? what, the supply chain problems they're having yes. and how that affects their business, how that affects them um, uh, building trucks, how that affects them completing orders, keeping their customers happy. And why is this all happening? Because their supply chain is just out of order. Exactly. Well, if you look at um, the... Let's use the Amazon example, right? I mean, Amazon started selling book online. They just want to be an e-commerce person selling books. And before long, they realised that by them being the outsider coming in and seeing how logistics actually worked, they go, selling books, we're not the book selling business. We're not a mug selling business. They're essentially, well, they are a logistics company today. Oh, it's a platform huge. where you plug and play. They've rec- recreated you know, they're probably, if you ask me what has been the biggest disruptor to logistics and supply chain, one word, Amazon, mm. right? They, they are, as if memory serves me correctly, they are the first ones to bring robots into a warehouse. Yep. And that's long before any industry leaders in the sector, within the industry, you know, how is it that we have a company who wanted to be a bookseller already charging ahead with all of this tech that the, whilst our, my industry has been sort of left wanting, and they're, they're preemptive too. Exactly. They knew that we had a problem coming in the ports. So, okay, why is it that all the bigger ships, they're all sitting out there off California? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. For, for 12 days waiting to get a berth and then yeah. they're, they're in and out because they don't even work at night at these ports. Yeah. And what's Amazon do? Oh, well, let's buy some old ships. Let's paint them blue, put a big smiley face on the side of it and we'll bring our little containers into smaller wharfs. Yeah. Like that's really – will the computer come up with this idea? No. I don't know about that. Not yet. Not yet. And let's hopefully – again, you know, this goes back to my earlier call, is status quo. Let's hopefully the status quo will keep um, the, the digital takeover at bay for some time. One of the subjects that I've been um, quite passionate about, and that's blockchain, mm-hmm. right? When, and you spoke about blockchain earlier in the TAFE um, situation. Um, you see, blockchain is a super powerful technology for supply chain. And the reason why there hasn't been too much pioneering in what this really means for logistics is because I think a lot of – our industry is too scattered. There isn't any real forum or a body of, say, that come together and study this. Uh, there's just too much divisiveness, right, self-interest and all that sort of stuff. And people can't actually get their head around, you know, blockchain, let alone how does it apply to technology. Um, to be honest, I'm probably only about maybe 50%, 60% there. Um, but from the little understanding that I have in terms of its tech and how it can apply to my business, um, it's both powerful, efficient, but at the same time, it's a huge threat to the status quo. Right, because once you apply blockchain technology to the shipment flow of what we do, say international shipment, there will be no more silly bugger games with paperwork. Mm. There will be no more mistakes on paperwork, so that's the efficiency. But there will be no more people, you know, playing with the flow, organic flow of paperwork that is today, mm. and to manipulate it to their means so they can have a financial gain. So that will kill off all of that instantly. So the status quo, I feel there will be smart ones out there can see that and they go, oh, oh, if this thing is rolled out, we've got no more money to be made here. So let me play the interviewer now. Okay. (laughs) Who decides what truck company to use? Who decides what? I I can feel this is a trick question. (laughs) (laughs) I'm your friend, you gave me the salami switch. (laughs) Who decides what truck company to use? Well, so obviously the coordinator, us, the freight forwarder, we, we, we will decide which truck uh, company to use. What's it based on? Based on our experience. Yeah, know how who to do the job well for a certain area um, versus others. I think it's a while before the computer can make that decision. But that's data, you see. Mm. You can do key metrics on that mm. and and you wouldn't be too far. You see, right now it's purely based on relationships, right? Mm. I can call this bloke and he's going to go the extra mile. Mm. But if I can crunch data and come in and pull all my suppliers and perform and see how they are, I can almost, you know, I, 
I do away with the relationship and I just purely go statistics. Mm. Now, that's exactly crossroads right now, right? We can go the relationship route or we can go the hard stats world. Mm. I don't like the hard stats world because it's cutthroat, it's, it's cold, it's black and white, right? Mm. But that brings efficiency. Mm. So this goes back the conundrum of technologies mm. versus human nature. Um, and this is why I think blockchain is frightening to a lot because it takes away the human organic element, which is what creates a lot of economy today's world. Yeah. We replace with tech. All that economy that comes from relationship is gone overnight. Yeah. And that's why I think that will hold tech back for a bit, mm. right? Um, so, yeah, it's look, I mean, this is something I think about all the time, Chris. And I don't know what the future, I'm, right now this is purely my opinion. Um, and I'm not one who likes opinions <laughs> because- Everyone's got one. Yeah, everyone's got one. Like something else, we all have one, but we don't like what comes out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that's why I'm probably lucky I'm in my job because yeah. I come to you guys and say, what, what's the answer yeah. and what do you need so we can build it? But uh, I'm not the one sitting up there at, at night trying to work it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's fascinating when you think about it, though. It is. It is. It keeps – well, it keeps, it keeps me up at night so, <laughs> because, you know, it, I live and breathe this stuff. So it's very it's, – it's something really at the forefront. And, and, you know, to all my industry colleagues out there, it should be – if they're passionate about what they do, it should be at their forefront of thinking in terms of what does all of this mean because – no one single person is going to come out with the answer. I can assure you of that. Mm. There'll be no Elon Musk of logistics happening anytime soon, yeah. right? Um, um, because this isn't about and just building an electric car, right? Which which is so accessible to everyone. This talks about complexity, a complex network of people, systems, government bodies coming together, doing trade. Yeah, and you can't replicate that with one set of code. Because, you know, there's going to be disagreements, regulatory level, private level and all that sort of stuff. So all of that complexity will hold back the natural technology that already exists today that can make everything so much easier. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves, do we want it to be that easy? Because if we think two steps ahead, yes, okay, it's great. But if we think 10 steps down the road, it will be a frightening thought. Yeah, yeah. And, and losing flexibility, that's the biggest killer. Yeah. Because, you know, I was thinking, well, let's say um, all, we, we've got governments, we've got shipping companies, we've got market demand, which changes, we've got weather, we've got, you know, all these variables in there, right? And to have an algorithm that can, you know, monitor all those different variables and all the unthought of ones is, is really risky. You know, let's say we just um, changed our government over a week and, oh, hang on, we just did that. <laughs> and, and there's a big change in, <laughs> there's a big change in policy and rules and laws change. Now, if you're a freight forwarding company on the other side of the world and you haven't got your eye on, you know, the lawmakers in another country and you haven't then updated your software, your automatic thing that's going to solve yeah, the world. No, yeah, yeah. that's a problem, yeah. you know. We have a change of government overseas yeah, yeah. and they say, okay, from now on this is what we're going to have. We're going to change in tariff or change in tax or different paperwork or different this or that. That's up to freight forwarders to be on top of their international affairs yeah. so that they can be flexible, pivot and, and, and make a change <laughs> and, you know... See, this, like, we've sort of almost like gone full circle on the, our conversation here now. It's like you're absolutely right. To be a successful freight forwarder, logistics person that plays on an international level, you, we, we are essentially with the current geopolitics, we have to be, be watching our radar when it comes to different countries, different rules, different regulatories, uh, regulations coming into play and going out of play and all that sort of stuff. You know, I think that's why Amazon's got the jump on everyone is they're, they're really good at that, you know, of watching it and they're making that move before everyone else. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and because they're plugged in, right, because yeah. they're plugged into these key markets. And they've got so, – so they might have these automatic factories but they've got a whole team of, you know, people looking at, 
you know, the big picture, understanding that, testing out their theories. And this That's comes, why they're yeah. successful. This, well, spot on because this comes on their platform and their business model, mm. right? Our business model is far less robust than Amazon's, of course, because why? We, like most, if not all of my competitors doing what I do, still got our old little hat on. And that is, you are the customer. We're just, like you said earlier, freight forwarder sounds like a milkman, right? We are the people that just move and transport your goods, right? Mm. And essentially, that's what we are. We don't reach further enough to have any robust, meaningful conversation or understanding. Mm. Whereas Amazon is taken over logistics, taken over the platform of selling the goods. So Amazon's come in and say, oh, you want to sell that? Sell over my platform. Oh, and we ship it for you if you want, right? Yeah. So they get access to every single key metric and key data, yeah. right? And that's why, you know, they're in this market, that market, what have you, they can see how people are buying the products. They got visibility to all of that. Now, as a freight forwarder, or let's don't even put TGL, let's put DHL. Even DHL cannot compete with that. Impossible. DHL doesn't have the data reach that Amazon has because DHL's platform is still the old world platform. I'm still the milkman delivering your milk. Whereas Amazon is like, oh, okay, you want to sell it. We don't want you to sell your way. You sell it our way. I'll capture your data. So that, again, is a complete monstrosity of a conversation right there. And that's why they're powerful. And you are right. They have to be on the ground to understand that because they are on the ground understanding all of the local regulations, you know, not just moving freight, but selling the product and getting consumer responses and feedback and all that sort of stuff. Super powerful stuff, super powerful. So on that bombshell, I think I've taken way too longer of your time, uh, Chris. It's been, uh, again, a very thoughtful, uh, thought-provoking conversation. And, um, and I'm very, very happy to have someone such as yourself from TAFE, you know, in charge of innovation, uh, for the logistics and supply chain, just having this conversation. And I think that goes a long way in sustainability and relevance is to start the conversation. Mm. And I'm really, really, really happy that we have, we have had this. And I hope our audience um, can um, 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 take something away from it and um, um, maybe, you know, get their brain juices flowing a little bit. And to all the young ones that's listening out there, you know, come and check out what this industry is all about because – it's, it's a very exciting industry, especially we're on the forefront talking about tech, forefront talking about, you know, even like, let's call it the elephant in the room, talking about industry survival, you know, we're in a fight. So come join the good fight. Um, and look up TAFE New South Wales, because I think it's an absolute robust platform for anyone who wants to bolt on new skill sets at a very accessible um, 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 way or process where you don't have to invest a lot. In fact, most of the courses are free of charge, as you heard from Chris. Um, and then, you know, build some more skill sets, you know, and be more relevant to the community that you're a part of. So again, thank you, Chris. And, um, and I will leave you have the last word to wrap up this wonderful um, episode, um, which I myself have learned a lot about TAFE New South Wales. Okay, well, thanks for having us, La. It's been a pleasure to just have a chat about all this. Um, I hope I've sparked some, uh, some young people out there, have that light bulb moment to uh, come up with the next idea. Yeah. Um, it's a really exciting industry to be in. Um, Lars, not under under talking at all. It's it's a great industry, and uh, the more you look at it, the more exciting the futures that can present itself, and it's good pay as well. A yes. lot of people don't talk about the pay. Um, so, yeah, if you want to learn more, if you want to get a qualification, as La kindly advertised for us, take New South Wales and um, thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Cheers, Thanks, mate. Bud. It's a wrap.